Well, hello there. You are tuned in to Lynn Pender. That's my name. I am an educator, an author, an entrepreneur. I'm also the founder of Take Action Publishing. And I am so honored that Take Action Publishing has an opportunity to be part of the 2020 virtual book fair. Wow, what an amazing two days of programming we have scheduled for you. And I'm excited to be able to feature some of the works by Take Action Publishing, as well as introduce you to some of our authors. So let me just share a little bit about Take Action Publishing. It is the vehicle that I use to self-publish my books. I am a Christian author. And it's also the vehicle that I use to publish anthologies that really challenge people to think about social issues impacting our world. We've had the honor of uh, coordinating two anthology projects. Our most recent project we published is an anthology called A Heart for GED Instructor Speak. A Heart for GED Instructors Speak is an anthology of short stories, creative essays, and poems. 16 ABE GED instructors from across the nation share funny, inspirational, and scary stories about teaching other learners in the United States. I'm excited because today joining me is one of the contributing authors of A Heart for GED Instructors her name is Mia Mia Johnson. She's not only a contributing author to this anthology project, but she's also one of my colleagues in the field of adult literacy. And it's such an honor to welcome you on the broadcast. Hello, Mia. Hi. Thank you for having me. I'm so honored to be here. Well, we're honored definitely to have you today here viewing with us as part of the 2020 virtual Harlem Book Fair, but we're also honored and blessed to have you as a contributing author to a Heart for GED instructor speak. And so I hoped you would just talk a little bit about who you are, Mia Miata Johnson, who you are and how you became an editor. Sure. Um, I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland. I grew up in a home where education was always important. My mother is a educator within the Baltimore City public school system for over 40 years. So education has always just been something that's been a part of my life. I consider myself a lifelong learner. I started off just working corporate jobs after college and it just wasn't fulfilling for me. So I wanted to make a career change where I made an impact. So I entered the Baltimore City Teaching Residency Program, which is a program that is designed for uh, people who do not have education background who want to teach. So I taught within the Baltimore City Public School System for about four years. And then, you know, I, I did my job. I felt like I was making an impact, but I also felt like, you know, I taught special education and there were labels that were placed on children. But they, didn't they didn't belong with those labels. For example, there might have been a young man in my class, and he just labeled as oppositional defiant, or a young woman who may have been several great levels behind, but was labeled mentally retarded. Yeah. The child wasn't mentally retarded, just needed some extra, you know, uh, reinforcement. And so when you have, especially when we're working in impoverished neighborhoods, there is a disconnect, right? There's a correlation between a parent who can't read, who's struggling, and then we have a child who, who's struggling, right? And so I made the shift to adult education in about 2009, and I would never, th I can't think of doing anything else with my life. I just feel <laughs> that helping adults has just yeah. been the most amazing experience ever. Yeah. To walk into a classroom and to be able to help women who look like me. Yes. Right? And, or help a young man who may have a tattoo on his eye and say, you know, Miss me, I can't read. Can you help me? You know, and so people who look like me are taught in the Sandtown Winchester community, the Freddie Grace community, when the riots were happening, like we were going to class while all of this chaos was going on around us. 
and we all, that was the safest place where they felt they could come yeah. and be uh, productive. Like, I got to get out of this house. Yes, it's all this stuff going around, but I'm coming to class, you know? And so those, those kind of things, you just make an impact on people's lives and you, those things are irreplaceable. You can't, you can't equate that to money. You can't equate that to, you know, anything tangible. When you see the light bulb go up in someone's eyes. And they finally get it. Or when you expose someone, just the exposure yeah. to the Pythagorean theorem or, you know, Edgar Allan Poe's Raven and make that connection. Like our, our football team is named after this poem, you know, and they, and they make these connections like, oh my God. So it's essential. It is indeed. And so I hoped you would talk a little bit about your, your uh, submission to the anthology. Uh, give us the title of the submission and give us the backstory if you, if you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I submitted a, you asked me and, you know, and to be able to tell the story about this young man who just came into my life and just just changed it for um, so many different reasons. The young man was named Dominique. And the, the title of the submission is called A Chance Moment. Me, it just, I just kind of give a little backdrop about my story, some of the things I told you about um, coming into the field and being able to touch uh, people's lives. This particular young man, Dominique, he was killed senselessly in our city and his death was impacted all of, I mean people came from everywhere to yes. put him you know balloons and you know um to candlelight vigils because he was a young man who was may you know statistically he may have fit certain you know criteria better for his son's life he wanted to go into the military you know and so those things they hurt that hurts you know, when you, when you see a student one day in class and you're, you're getting on them because they didn't turn in their assignment and you want the best for them. And the next thing you know, you're, you're getting text messages saying that this young man is dead. And ironically, we're going to, on a field trip, my, one of my classes is going on a field trip. And one of the young women said, oh, let's meet at the corner of this and this. And I was like, oh my God, that's the corner where... Dominique was killed. And so when we go on our field trip mm. on, on Monday, I'm going to take my sage and I'm just going to set, I'm just going to just consecrate that, that space because I knew that was the last place he was. Yeah. And ironically, I'm talking about him today and I'm going to be at that space on Monday. So I don't think any of this is, is by accident at all, yes. you yeah. know, and we're having, you know, this global uprising Oh, yes. Out of that frustration, it comes healing. Out of that frustration comes love and, you know, togetherness. Because we, we, we're not going to make it in this world by ourselves. Ind individually, we're not going to make it. We have to come together collectively. Absolutely. And, and just as you mentioned, you know, um, what a heart-wrenching experience. But it's so real for many of us. Uh, we live in Baltimore City, and um, the, the, the statistics show that there's murders, not just one, but multiple, you know, on a daily basis. But in, in, despite even that, there's still hope in this city. There's still people like you, Mia, who are working to be sure that some of our most impacted families have the type of support they need to survive. And it is timely. You know, there was a 2019 report by the Able Foundation noting that an estimated 81,000 Baltimore City adults age 18 and over are lacking a high school diploma, the absence of which leaves them at a considerable disadvantage in the current economy and is correlated with a host of other poor outcomes for individuals, their families, and the broader community. And I'm sure that Baltimore is just a mirror of many other urban cities across the nation where these types of social economic issues just kind of create a ripple 
effect where children of parents with low literacy skills across the nation have a 72% chance of being at the lowest reading levels themselves. These children are more likely to get poor grades, display behavioral problems, have high absentee rates, repeat school years, or even drop out. That's what the studies are saying. So if parents are better educated, then their children will have greater academic assess. And we always hear parents are our children's first teachers, right, Mia? We always hear that. But if parents don't have the literacy skills, right, to really be able to support their children, then that's where the problem lie. And that's why it's so imperative for educators like yourself to be in the fight. And so we so appreciate you. So I take my hat off to you because I so appreciate not just the, the, the love that you have for your work, but I appreciate the commitment that you put into doing your work so that it's a quality educational experience. And I just wanna share one other statistics. Um, this, and this is a national statistic. It says of adults with the lowest literacy level skills, 43% live in poverty and 70% of adult welfare recipients have low literacy levels. There is a clear correlation between more education and higher earnings and between higher educational scores and higher earnings. And so I hope Mia that you could just speak to that statistic for us. Well, let me say this. You know, um, reading has always been something that has been a passion for me. Math never has been my, and, and the fact that I teach math and I struggled my entire life yeah. with math, that the creator is using me in that way. Like I just taught a lesson on the Pythagorean theorem last night and they were getting it. And I was like, oh my God, like I, 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 I would struggle with like, the fact that I'm being used in that way is just so amazing to me, right? Yeah. And so reading has always been a passion of mine. You know, like in the eighth grade, I was, you know, testing on like college level for reading, right? And so, you know, when you, I think I, I know I did. I took for granted that people could read. I just did. I just assumed that people could read, you know? and and so. When you step into that classroom, people don't care education. They don't care about your degrees. They care. They want to know that you care, right? Yes. And so I had to learn through this experience that it is not about judgment. You know, it is about love and compassion and empathy. And it's about helping people. So, you know, it's always been like, you know, a fear of people's to read out loud, right? Yes. And so I've been working with, you know, students, you know, some of them for years, mm -hmm. right? Some of, we've had some of the same students for years and they continue to yes. come, you know, and they, they continue to get better. Yeah. And I had a young woman, thing, right? And I tried to, you know, uh, choose material that I know um, that may have some challenging words, but I also know that there's some sight words that they could, you know, just like, you know, roll off their tongue. Yeah. And so I had to read a paragraph. It wasn't long because, you know, we want to have a certain level of success with, with what we're doing, right? We mm -hmm. don't want to set our, our students up for failure, right? Mm -hmm. So I had her read a small passage and Miss Lynch read it perfectly. And a year ago, she would have been struggling over those sight words. She'd been struggling over those small words, right. right? And she read it perfectly. And I stopped and I said, TT, let me say something. You've come a long way. Because mm -hmm. a year ago, you would have through that passage and you read it perfectly, right? And so it's about confidence building. It's about investing in people. Yeah. Right? Because now, TT, can have some confidence when her seven-year-old has something that they have to read. And yes. before she couldn't help them, but now she can. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And so the statistics are very true, but we have to look beyond those statistics. Yes. We have to take those, yeah. we have to take that knowledge and that information, this data, this qualitative and quali quantitative and qualitative information and make it meaningful for what we do. And I just want to salute you for putting this anthology together, you know, for, because 
let me say this, and I know that you know this is true. We're shamed sometimes for what we do. Yeah. Oh, you teach, you, what do you teach? GED classes, all of that education you got, you could be doing. I can do a lot of other things. Yeah. I know firsthand how important this is. Yeah. When you see that young man or that young woman or that 80 year old with that high school diploma that they've been working for towards for years or first generation immigrants who come here right? Yes. And they have, may yes. have had that credential in their country, but they have to start over because there's a language barrier, right? And see them walk across that stage. It's amazing. It makes all of this that we do worthwhile. It does. All of the struggle, all of the, it, it just makes it all worthwhile. It does. It does. And so I, again, I thank you. Your, your title of your piece in the anthology is called A Chance Moment. And um, as we're preparing to close out uh, this conversation, which has been wonderful, I want you to talk a little bit about what that chance moment meant to you. Uh, a chance moment me meant for me or means for me is that um, had I followed this monetary track, you know, yeah. in life, chasing money, right, or um, looking for the next opportunity to, you know, to have this title behind my name, right, I would never have met Dominique. Yeah. I would never have the opportunity to stand in front of that young man and to pour into him and have him pour into me. Stand in a classroom and deliver instruction and help people to meet their educational goals and meet their, help them meet their life goals, right? Is that's, it, I, I think I named it a chance moment, but it really wasn't. Mm. It was divinely orchestrated. The creator yes. put, that, put us together for, for that particular time and that, for that particular season for a particular reason. Right. And even though he's left this earthly plane, he's not he's no longer with us. But the impact that he had in people's lives and the impact that I had in his life. Right. And so when I read the article heartbreaking in the Baltimore Sun and he quoted someone quoted him that said, I, you know, I, I just want to get my high school diploma so that I can go into the military. Right. I was like, wow. Yeah. I had something to do with that, even though he's no longer here. Me being in that classroom with that young man for that small amount of time was helping him toward reaching a larger goal, right? And so he, had, he left a son here, right? Yeah. He has a son left on this planet. So hopefully the impact that his father's had in his life and maybe the small father's life will be a positive deposit in that young man. Wow. Wow. Thank you again. So I'm just, I'm, you know, I, I'm really just thankful for that you were able to allow me to share. And I'm thankful that you chose um, this anthology to share that powerful story. And so I just want to remind our viewers that you have the opportunity to pick up a copy of a Heart for GED Instructor Speak. You can visit the website at www.aheartforged.com. There's also information there on the website about Mia. And um, Mia, if folks wanted to get in contact with you, how can they do that? Because you do a whole lot of other sure, great things too. I do. I have a Facebook page, um, Mia Miata, M-I-A-M-I-A-T-A. -A. You can reach out to me on Instagram, M-I-A-M-I-A-T-A. -A. Or if you'd like to uh, email me, it's Mia Miata at gmail.com. All right. Well, thank you again for sharing with Take Action Publishing in the conversation about a heart for GED instructors speak. And we really could see, we could really feel your heart today, Mia. And thank you for sharing. Thank you for allowing me to share. And thank you for tuning in. My name is Lynn Pender. I'm with Take Action Publishing.